2 Timothy 2.15 says, Present yourself to God as one approved, a workman who does not need to be ashamed, rightly handling the word of truth. The phrase rightly handling simply means to cut it straight. Paul used it as a tent maker. Construction workers used it in paving a smooth path or road. Doctors used it in reference to making a clean incision for surgery. And scripture uses it to say that you ought to rightly handle the word of God in the preaching moment. I'm inviting you to join us for the Cutting It Straight Expository Preaching Conference here in Jacksonville, September 24 through 26, 2014. We will give you practical instruction in Bible exposition. We will model faithful preaching for you. And we'll encourage you in your journey to preach faithfully the word of God. I hope you'll join us for this special time. Good day, my name is H.B. Charles Jr. I am the pastor of the Shiloh Metropolitan Baptist Church in Jacksonville, Florida. I'm the author of the book, It Happens After Prayer, and the new release entitled On Preaching. I write a blog as well that can be found at hbcharlesjr.com. It is my privilege to have with me Dr. Gary Williams, who is the senior pastor of the First Baptist Church of Mandarin. Thank you, Pastor Gary, for Good being with me. Good to be with you, Pastor. Honored to be with you. I first uh, heard about you some years ago before I moved. I hope it was good. It was good. Okay, good, it was good. good. My introduction to you was in uh, San Antonio. Mm. I was doing a meeting there and um, I saw a flyer mm. on the uh, pastor's conference table where I was sitting for the pastor's conference okay, okay. that you uh, regularly uh, do. I, I knew some of the speakers, but that was the first time I had seen okay. uh, First Baptist okay. and Gary Williams, and I began to follow you from afar. Okay. And uh, then uh, just a short while after that, the Lord transitioned me here, mm. and uh, we got to know each other, and mm. I'm glad to mm. have that partnership with you. Mm. I'm glad about your work in the city. Mm -hmm. Thanks. I, I appreciate that, Pastor, and uh, thank God for your work, for your gift to the body. Mm -hmm. I believe you're a great voice uh, to the body of Christ and uh, in helping uh, all of the co-laborers to help to build the kingdom. Thanks, brother. Mm -hmm. I appreciate that. So you are born and raised in Jacksonville. Yeah, one of few, you know. Uh -huh. uh, <laughs> uh -huh. And you probably experience that now. You know, at our church, uh, we have, you know, most people are transient. They're from some other place, mm -hmm. but uh, born and raised right here in Jacksonville. Matter of fact, not too far uh, from Shiloh. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Well, tell me about your upbringing, your family. You're uh, uh, from a preacher's family. We had that in common. Uh, and that is correct. Uh, my father, he's been uh, going on to be with the Lord uh, for about uh, 27 years, actually. And so mm -hmm. I started uh, preaching about three years after he passed and, and pastoring not long after that. And uh, he pastored the Mount Eric Church here in uh, uh, Jacksonville. Mm -hmm. My uncle is a pastor who pastors Macedonia on uh, Edgewood Avenue. Mm -hmm. And uh, he's been pastoring here for years. My brother is also a pastor. So we're, you know, I was probably the run in the litter, though. You know, the <laughs> last one of, uh, uh -huh. of this generation, uh -huh. you know, my generation, uh, to be called into ministry. But yes. Well, what was that like for you coming up as a boy, uh, just uh, surrounded by ministry? preaching uh, family members? I, well, it was something that I, 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 I always revered it. I had a great regard for men of God. I, uh, you know, at the age of nine, I got saved and uh, my father pastored a church down in Sanford, Florida, hmm. uh, St. John's Baptist Church, Sanford, Florida on 10th and Cyprus. And uh, one of the local pastors here was doing a revival, Pastor George Price. And on a Thursday night, I gave my life to the Lord. And so I've, church has been a part of my life since I can remember. 
I never, you know, as there's only two of us, my brother and I, and, uh, <laughs> you know, when seeing so many preachers and pastors come in town when my father was, you know, hosting revival. So, of course, a lot of the guys around church, we would play preaching, you know, when the guys, you know, pastors left on and so forth. But I never uh, desired to do it, okay. you know, and uh, it was not until my father passed. I united with my wife's church, and that's when I got the call of the Lord, and, and I knew it was the Spirit of God uh, calling me into ministry. So you didn't think you would be a preacher. What did you think you would be, or well, what did I, you want to be? I wanted to be in real estate, a real estate magnet. Uh -huh. I wanted to be a millionaire by the time I was 40 years of age, uh -huh, so that, uh -huh. was, uh, that was my mindset. Uh -huh. uh, one of the things that my father uh, taught me was, uh, taught us, my, my brother and I, was to whatever you wanted to be or whatever you desired to be, try to ascertain as much information about that as possible, learn as much about it as you can. And he says, now you may not be the best, but you sure ought not be the worst. Mm -hmm. So that was my, you know, that was the goal. I was in real estate and, uh, you know, going on at that particular time. And, uh, you know, the Lord called me into ministry and I knew what it was. And, uh, you know, I just, you know, moved and gravitated, you know, toward ministry. How, how long were you uh, in real estate? Uh, Probably about five years. Five years? Mm -hmm, probably about five years. So the call to preach, was this something sudden or dramatic or was this something building or was the Lord chasing you for a while? Yeah, that, and I think that's a great question. It, was, it, it actually wasn't building. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, on that particular Sunday, uh, it was a Sunday and I got, it was uh, in uh, 1988, uh, I think somewhere around, um, uh, probably July or August of, of uh, 88. Hmm. And it was just, a, uh, uh, I united, as I said, after my father passed, my wife, I got married a year after my father died. And so I united with my wife's church. Mm -hmm. uh, pastor William C. Bach is, is my pastor. And that was King Solomon United Baptist Church. Well, we were just in worship. You know, I've always been attended to worship. I grew up in church. And uh, for that on that particular day, I just couldn't, focus mm. and and what I called it or deemed it I kind of classified as a yearning uh, I knew you know at the uh, uh, it happened in service and as soon as service was over I went to my pastor and told him pastor the Lord has called me to preach I knew exactly what it was and I said you know I've been around it you know been around ministry and preaching you know for the longest but I knew exactly what it was Wow mm -hmm. so you've been married a year when this happens right right uh, I got we got no you would ask me that pastor uh, <laughs> uh, we, <laughs> uh -huh. we got married in uh, and that's true because Maxine and I got married in 1987 uh-huh and this was in 1988. Our first, our daughter, uh, well, Brittany was born in 1988, in April of 88. Mm -hmm. We were married in April of 87. And the call came probably in uh, somewhere around July or August of, uh, of 88. So. Did your wife expect this? No, and uh, you know, we, years earlier, that was one of the things that we talked about was, uh, you know, man, I never thought, you know, I'd be married to, a, right. you know, to, a, to, you know, a minister and then needless to say a pastor. And I said, well, I never thought you'd be married to one either. <laughs> <laughs> so it kind of went both ways. Sure. <laughs> uh -huh. So um, how long were you preaching uh, before you started pastoring? You said not long. It was not long. Actually, uh, I started preaching and this is, uh, you know, I was really on fast track. I did my first sermon in September of 88. Okay, and what was the first sermon? Uh, it was from a, a frightened disciple that was dealing with Peter mm -hmm. when, uh, and uh, Jesus told him that, uh, uh, behold, Satan has desired to have you that he may sift you as wheat. Mm. And, uh, and I talked about, you know, after the fact how Peter would eventually deny Christ. And mm -hmm. so that, that was the message. but. Uh, I actually started my, uh, I actually started uh, my first, I, this is crazy. And, and it, it I, you know, I, it, it's the providence of God. Uh, I did my first sermon in September of 88. I was licensed and ordained in October of the, the in the next month. Uh, and and uh, what happened was, to kind of give you the, you know, the quick and dirty on it, uh, after I'd done my first sermon, 
uh, my pastor came to him. I'll never forget it was on a Tuesday night. He said, well, Gary, I want to talk to you. I said, all right, pastor. And man looked like for 20 minutes, he just kind of meandered around. And I'm like, you know, I was saying, I didn't say this to him, but I was saying, you know, pastor, get to the, you know, what is he saying? Yeah. There were a couple of guys who were already going through the presbytery to be licensed and ordained. Hmm. And so, and then at this time, especially here in Jacksonville, you, you know, one of the, at that particular era, that, that time in our city's history, especially among African-American churches, first of all, you didn't even license associates. Okay. And uh, the old school mentality was you always got to keep something over <laughs> their head. And, and, uh, and then the other thing was <laughs> is that typically the mindset was you only license an ordained an associate minister when a church called him. Now, right. that was the climate. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. My pastor sat down, long story short, he said, well, listen, I want to put you up for ordination. I said, whoa, pastor, wait a minute. I said, I, I, you know, you know, and I had a couple of questions. Well, you, you know, I just did my first sermon. He said, I know. He says, but uh, God had his hand on, has his hand on. He said, and in that, the spirit of the Lord tell me, you know, this is, you know, it's your season. So another question I asked, well, pastor, what are people going to say? You hmm. know, people are going to say, well, this boy ain't been here long enough. Mm-hmm. And so he says, well, listen, he says, uh, uh, I've watched you. He said, uh, uh, I've known you for years. And so he says, well, listen, he says, the Lord has called me to pass in, so I'm going to do it. And so against the wishes of some, some say, well, listen, it's too early, it's too soon. The presbytery raked me through the cold. I mean, and it was really nothing on my, pertaining to my faith or, or you know, uh, Baptist policy or nothing. You know, it, it was nothing. But I mean, they raked me over the cold. Mm-hmm. And uh, but he licensed and ordained, and that was in October of 88. In, Oct- in July of 89, First Baptist of Mandarin became available. I was in the office with my pastor, sitting across from the table from him. He was talking on the phone to the chairman of deacons. And so I didn't know what the conversation was. But at the end of the conversation, he asked the question. Well, he says, Gary, what are you doing uh, next Sunday? I said, well, pastor, I'll be here at church. He said, no, you're going to preach at First Baptist of Mandarin. I said, First Baptist of Mandarin? Well, if you're a native of Jacksonville, you know Mandarin is a suburb. So my question was, is that a white church or is it a black church? He said, no, it's a black church. So I went there. Their pastor had just left. And uh, I was the first one to preach after that pastor had left. And over a series of, uh, you know, a few candidates, uh, I was the last one to preach again. And then in uh, January uh of uh, 1990, they called me to be their pastor. And so it was- So this was an extended period because you started preaching in 88. I started preaching in 88. Mm -hmm. The church came available in 89. Okay. And uh, you know, and so, and I I, I really trained under my father, but I got the opportunity to kind of get OJT with my pastor. He gave me the opportunity to uh, stand by him. I mean, he trained me. Uh, made me the minister, his ass- assistant. And so within that, he trained me and taught me and then really gave me, you know, it, instructions and a lot of things. And I was still green in a, in a lot of things. Mm-hmm. But, uh, you know, at that particular time, our church was only about, had about 70 members. And so we have several thousand now by God's grace. Were, were you um, desiring this? You're watching a process where you are knowing that potentially you could end up being the pastor of this right. church. Is this something you're... De- desiring what what's going through your mind because you've been preaching about a year or so right uh this is a fast track right what are you feeling about and this that's a, i think that's a great question uh uh i did not desire it as it began okay uh in the uh commencement of it i didn't de- de- desire it through the process and the process of of you know preaching going back teaching you know uh answering certain questions on and so forth uh I believe it, you know, uh, I think it was Ronald Reagan who says that, you know, pressure and trials really don't, uh, don't define a man. They just simply reveal who he is. And mm-hmm. I think that at doing that process, it reveal it, I, I, one of the things that I shared with my wife at the, as they were coming to the end of the selection process, I told her this, I said, even if it's, if, if First Baptist doesn't choose me, I said, the Lord is already birthed in my spirit now is that it's time for me to, you know, kind of move to the next level. Mm-hmm. And so it was not something that I saw. It was not something that I desired. Mm-hmm. But after being a part of the process, I recognized that it was something that I was ready for. Wow. Mm-hmm. Wow. Mm-hmm. So how often in this um, 
interval period, you start preaching before you get to First Baptist, how often are you getting to preach and exercise your gift during that period? And my, you know, I, <clears throat> I would say quite often, more than most. And uh, part of that was I, I really, I thank God for my pastor. Uh, even today, there are times where I'll just call, I'll send him a love gift just out of the blue, just because the things that I have experienced in my life, you know, uh, is as a result of uh, the doors that God used him to open for me. Mm -hmm. And I will, I will forever be in his debt for the things that he has done. I will never forget uh, William Cullen Barker as my pastor. He gave me the opportunity to teach you know, I preached quite often and uh, was able to sit in on counseling and some other things. I mean, he really kind of groomed me is what he did. And I mean, it just he was like my he reminded me so much of my father in that he was before his time, especially in that particular era. And uh, I mean, gave me the opportunity to teach. And a lot of times and this, you know, something for young preachers or preachers who do not you know, necessarily get the platform and the stage, you know, use that gift, whether it be Sunday school, whether it be new members orientation, whether it be discipleship training. What it does is that it helps to hone and train your skills. And a lot of times the classroom is much better than the pulpit because in that, if you're in the classroom, you have to interact. And with that interaction, you know, it calls for questions and answers, sure. which means this, you know, I mean, we, you know, on Sunday mornings, you know, we have the stage, that's it. You know, mm -hmm, it's mm -hmm, no, you mm -hmm. know, the dialogue should be amen or praise God or hallelujah. Yeah. But in that classroom, you know, you have to really, you know, uh, make sure that you've done, uh, you know, your due diligence in your study. I, I tell uh, young training ministers that if you want to prepare yourself a pastor, that's where you need to focus on. Um, the other dynamic is when you get to those Bible classes, that's where the folk in the church who know the Bible be. You can't, you know, they're not the folk, they don't come to Sunday school class to shout for you to practice your hoop on. You got to know, yeah? That's right. Yeah, so I mean, it, it's, it's a good honing ground. That's right. Yeah, that's and, good. And I think it would do well if many more, you know, uh, especially our younger preachers mm -hmm. would grasp that opportunity. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Okay, so yeah. you got a lot of opportunity. I did. Now, when my father, when I, I started preaching when I was 11, mm. my father was well respected in our city. Mm -hmm. And his generosity to a lot of preachers opened doors for me. They, mm. they wanted to reward the old man by preaching this kid. Right. And that, um, then afterward, uh, after his death, when I was just 16, mm. between his death and I would say the next year and a half, I mean, I could count on my hands the Sundays I didn't preach. Mm. They just were all kind of, right. did you get a lot of outside? I, and I did. Did that and, happen to you as well? Right. And that was as a result of my, it, it's, it's the same. Good you deal. Know, uh -huh. uh, you know, we, you know, and I, I, in that uh, analogy, I think about uh, uh, David and, and, and Jonathan and Melchizedek. You right. know, it's uh, the seeds that were sown by the father were reaped by the son. Yeah. And so that, you know, people really didn't know me. They yeah. didn't know me, but they knew my, you know, once I started uh, preaching and especially pastoring and, you know, some of the older guys, boy, your daddy was a friend of mine. Come on over and do this. And so it kind of went like that. Good deal. Mm -hmm. Good deal. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So how many books have you written at this point? Uh, probably about six. I've got, you know, I, I have <laughs> three more that I just haven't brought together and send it, put out the copyrights for so you know I you know uh, and that comes out of your preaching the themes of I, like, some of them have the, yes uh, uh, my book on man to man that came I dealt with a, a man and his mind a man and his marriage a man and his ministry you know that came out of preaching my very first one was not out of my preaching theme which was you know what some would consider what would be controversial back then and it was dealing with this download, you know, and mm -hmm. so a deliverance from the download. That was my very first book. And uh, but that was not from, uh, you know, my, my preaching things. Uh, I've done one prevailing over pornography. Hmm. Uh, that was I did a theme on that. So that came out of uh, another book. Uh, uh, Why can't I hold on to this grudge? And that deals with the power of forgiveness, being able to let go. That was one that was also uh, out of a theme. Um, one that we have on the uh, 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 21 days to breakthrough, which is a 21 day devotional. Uh, so most of the, the major, uh, 90 percent of them are out of the, you know, something that I've, I've preached on. And, and what I've tried to do 
is to go in because writing is different from speaking. Sure. You know, one of the things that people don't want to do is read a sermon. Mm-hmm. So you have, you know, it, it, you know, and and it calls your words are different as well. You know, we we speak differently from how we read. Mm-hmm. So that's I love reading and I love writing. Right, you know, that birthed something in me that I didn't know that I that I had. But uh, but most of them to answer your question, yes. Even though these are different disciplines, mm-hmm. but reading, I am finding that the more you, of course, the more you read, but the more you write it sharpens you for the pulpit. It has a way of uh, just the word selection, how you're preparing yourself, it it, it's, it's a benefit. It does, mm-hmm. it does. Um, so what were the opening years? You've now served at First Baptist Mandarin for 24 mm-hmm. years. Uh, you had described it as the suburbs. Mm-hmm. Tell us a little bit about what the climate of Mandarin mm-hmm. was and then how the church fit in that dynamic and what those opening years were for you. Uh, the opening years were, uh, they were just that opening, <laughs> opening years. They were, you know, when you're, I think when you, in it, when you're young, you're naive to a lot of things. Uh, you know, most of the churches that I've been affiliated with have been in the urban community. Uh, being in the suburbs was just a totally different dynamic. And I found that out probably about my seventh or eighth year ministry. Uh, that we were doing uh, outreach and evangelism, that particular time knocking on doors. One year we knocked on uh, uh, 3,000 doors. Another year we knocked on 6,600 doors. Hmm. And you would have thought that we were vacuum cleaner, used car, (laughs) uh, toolkit salesmen. I mean, man, people calling the church and... You know, we don't need that out here. Uh, and, uh, and so uh, one of the things that I have learned, you know, uh, is that a lot of times uh, affluence brings with it a disdain for God. Mm-hmm. You know, people have a mindset that, you know, that religion or Christianity or church is for uh, for poor people, the people who are who have low self-esteem mm-hmm. and, or et cetera, et cetera. And so, uh, uh, you know, that was the mindset. So it was, it was a revelation in the culture. And then the other thing is this, is that, you know, as I said, most of my life, I've been a part of ministries that have been in urban communities. When it's time to coalesce around uh, events and circumstances on and so forth, from my own experience, those who are in the urban community are more willing to do. Those who are in the suburbs, uh, you know, they would prefer to write a check, <laughs> mm-hmm. you know. Then mm-hmm. and so it's, you know, it was a, you know, a constant learning experience. Uh, I don't, you know, I, as I said, I would guess I was naive in the, in the fact of just thinking that things would be similar, you know, because we're still, you know, predominantly African American. But there are those who, a lot of times in the suburbs, they'll take on that suburbanite mentality as well. And mm-hmm. so those are some of the, you know, those were some of the challenges, you know, in those those first formative years. Uh, what was the state of the church? You, you said it was uh, not very large, but was it a strong, healthy church when you got there? Would you uh, describe it that way or? Well, I guess I would ask you to define healthy. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh-huh, uh-huh. You know, what, I mean, healthy and, I mean, they, they were, I mean, it was a, it was a good church. Okay. You know, uh, uh, the church was warm. Uh, the challenge was, and this was the mindset of the church. You know, I, I was the probably one of the youngest things there. You know, 27 years of age when I started. Hmm. So the and this was the mindset. And interesting enough, I found this out after, you know, <laughs> a couple of years after we started pastoring, is that, well, one of the reasons why I was selected was okay. Well, they could help too hone me or you know whatever so that was <laughs> pass to you <laughs> <laughs> you know and you know but I you know I, I you know for the lack of a better phrase the churches other than my pastor's church the churches that my father had been a part of quote been a part of were hell raising churches mm-hmm. I mean that's just the truth I mean and then I you know my narrative is not that far from here uh, I grew up, you know, I mean, you know, we grew up, I knew, you know, what church fights were, you know, folk back in the day would take, bring guns to church. I mean, we had our house egged and, mm-hmm. you know, you got a, a, 
crank my dad's car up. I mean, it was, I mean, we, you know, you talking about WWF, you just go on 2503 North Murder <laughs> Avenue and that's where it was. <laughs> so for the most part, you know, I grew up in that, still had a reverence for God, but I mean, it, it, and it was sad because it took a toll on my father. That was one of the things that I think that no doubt caused him to lose his life at a young stress and all of that. Mm -hmm. But it built within me a resolve that, I mean, I mean, that everything else that happened was, I mean, it really paled in comparison to the things that I saw. Gotcha. But, uh, but that was the mindset, okay, we're going to train and we're going to hone him, you know, on and so forth. That was the mindset. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So <clears throat> what do you walk in the door focusing on? You, you knew it, pastoral ministry. You have not been in pulpit ministry that long. They have turned over this church to you, but not really right <laughs> they've given it to you but they're holding your well, hands they, pretty they tight. really haven't given it to you. <laughs> uh, right 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 <laughs> um they give you they give us the title pastor and, yeah and yeah. a business card yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you get your name on the bullet <laughs> that's <thing>. right <laughs> <laughs> so what do you come in focusing on what what is, what is the emphasis of your formative years there the formative years there were first of all just to observe gotcha. and I, I remember those days vividly one of the things you know, my, my father is, is my hero. M much of what I do now in ministry is still attributed to him, even though I was not preaching nor pastoring, you know, uh, during the time that he was living. You know, I, I learned how to preach from my dad because one of the things that I would do is that after each worship, especially the 11 o'clock service, we would go up, my brother and I would go up in the study and he would have the other ministers to go over the sermon and the message with him. And I, and I, he would, I'm engaged with them. So, you know, I got the opportunity. Everything was a lesson to dad. And the other thing was this, is that uh, he taught us that the man who's, who is a poor observer, he's going to fail life. Mm. And so one of the first things that I did was you know, people, I, there were people coming to me, okay, well, you need to do this. You need to watch this. And what are you going to do here? I said, I'm, going to, I'm not going to do anything right now. And the reason I'm not going to do anything now is because I don't know what's working and I don't know what's failing. And so, there'll, of course, there'll be some changes later on. But the very first thing that I did probably for the first six months is that I was just patient and just observing. Hmm. After observing, then one of the things that I did is that the things that I could tackle first with the least amount of resistance was the thing that I did, you yeah. know? And so, you know, it's kind of, you know, building <laughs> momentum and building traction, you know, now. And, I, and then the other thing is this, I mean, let's be honest. Regardless of how gifted or skilled we are, you know, when you go, and, and this permeates and transcends denominations. When you go to a church, you know, there are power brokers in that church, I mean, that that's just I'm just being just telling the truth. Mm -hmm. And so there are people who know brother so and so brother Joe elder this more than they know you. Mm -hmm. And in that they go to him, they ask him for questions, they bounce things off of him. So I understood that I had a business card. My name was on the little marquee and, you know, it was on the bulletin, but I was no more in the past than this, you know, glass of water. Sure. And so, but what I learned is that, you know, is over time, every day, the aim and intent, the, the uh, intent was to become more of the pastor today, yeah. you know, than I was on yesterday. And that's through preaching, that's through teaching, that's through building people up in their faith. And then not only that, but that's through accentuating the principles and tenets of the word of God. One of the things that I tell ministers is this, young ministers, if you are a poor, I feel sorry for the pastor who's a poor teacher or a poor poor preacher yeah because everything that we do if listen if the word won't do it it's not going it's nothing we can do yes so and that was my aim and my intent it was to observe it was to preach it was to teach it was to build up healthy people and so that's how you know it, you know and then you of course integrity and honesty and you win people's trust and that type of thing sure yeah. um not to degenerate just to honor what you're saying just it's no deep revelation is just common sense. That's right. Yeah, That's but I right. think we, we we start out in pastorates and we don't think that way. That's right. We don't use common sense That's about right. those kinds of That's things. That's right. We come in with a vision. That's right. <laughs> and sometimes they, they, they're setting you up by asking, what's and, your vision? And, not, and, to, and, and, to, and a, you know, credit to your point, uh, I, ha I have a couple of guys who honor me, some of my sons in the ministry, and they've gone out, you know, some churches have invited them to candidate and, you know, and the question has come up. And one of the things that I've shared with them 
is that, you know, they're going to ask, well, what is your vision for the church? I said, well, you know, there's always a, a specific general vision, and that's, of course, of all for us to grow spiritually, you know, numerically as well, mm -hmm. you know, on and so forth. Those are the things. But to lay out a, a, a vision when you don't even have the concept, when you don't even understand the structure or the inner workings, you don't know the paradigm. Yeah. You're right. Now, that's, you can't, you, you don't, you know, the vision may be, first of all, to get us out of debt or what, I mean, you know, it depends on the gravity of the situation with the church. So, you know. Nehemiah walked around the city before he, yes, he did. before he called a meeting and said, this, we need to rise up and build. That's right. Yeah. That's like right. Sometimes we just show up in the city. <laughs> 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 and that's when uh, Sam Ballard and them take that's us out. <laughs> <laughs> Another thing you mentioned that I think is an important factor is, uh, man, if I would say this to a uh, desiring preacher, growing preacher, new pastor, the power is in the pulpit. Mm. You, you are absolutely right. Mm. If you focus on preaching that's right. and teaching the word of God mm. and trying to over time mm. shape the life by the authority of the word, mm. You know, um, that leads to maturity and health mm. in the church. Mm. If you're trying to be, you know, mm. trying to out duel mm. leaders in the back room, mm. you know, and those mm. kinds of things, mm. you, you, those, are, those will be casualties mm. that's on right. your part. And, and, and you'll be one of the first <laughs> yeah, casualties. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> right, that's what I mean. <laughs> you'll be yeah. the first casualty. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. Now, during this period, I, you're, you've talked about your your father and your pastor, mm. who else were A, models of ministry mm. and B, heroes of preaching for you? I would say one of the heroes would be uh, uh, Charles Jackson out of Houston, mm -hmm. uh, Texas, Pleasant Grove Church, Houston, Texas. Uh, he's a, you know, a, a, a unique, gifted preacher, pastor, but in that, the wisdom that he has. And uh, he was, you know, it would be my father, it would be my pastor, then it would be Charles Jackson, who oh. was, uh, I mean, really honing me. Uh, the Lord has blessed me to travel extensively, to travel the world. That started actually with my father. One day he sat me down, he said, now, son, a lot of times, uh, and this was years before preaching, I guess, you know, God, you know, in his providence, perhaps uh, let him know or showed him something because he would take those times and train me. Hmm. But, uh, you know, he said, now, the difference in people is exposure. And one of the things that helps you with exposure is travel. And that's not just within the States, that's around the world. I've been blessed to preach around the world, been to Russia, I preach down in Cuba, uh, uh, over in the Ukraine, I've been there. Uh, and so, uh, you know, been to Australia, preached among the Aboriginals. So I've, I've been blessed with uh, that opportunity. Uh, Charles Jackson came and not knowing my father told me this because my father was deceased at the time that I really start sharing with him. At that particular time, uh, uh, Charles Jackson had come to our church, E.V. Hill had come on and so forth. Well, you know, so I kind of, made somewhat those connections. And so Pastor Charles brought me out, kind of mentored me some, and, but taught me the same thing. And I, you know, he had begun to, he was traveling and it was as though I was talking to my father all over again. And then just teaching me, you know, just very common sense things about church, about people, about leadership, about preaching. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, th those were the men that kind of honed me and uh, that I would attribute, uh, you know, whatever little su success or, you know, whatever, you know, the Lord has blessed, blessed me to do. It's been that he's used those men as instruments, you know, in, in my life. Mm, mm. Praise God. Mm. Did you know Pastor Charles is an author with the second book being released? The book On Preaching officially releases on May 1st, but Pastor Charles is letting us be a part of the pre-release. It's not just for preachers, but anyone who appreciates sound doctrine in the pulpit. Uh, any others that influenced you that you would? N not as, uh, I mean, you know, uh, you know, th there are, you know, there are a lot of 
men of faith, you know, that I admire, I admire, you know, from a distance. But though th that particular circle, uh, you know, uh, were the men who helped to hone me. I had a seminary professor, Dr. Les Warren, real kind of arduous dude, hmm. but stayed on me, you mm -hmm. know, in my studies. And, I, and uh, now I'm appreciative of that. You yeah. know, uh, Gary, you know, he's a, you know, uh, one of my white professors, he, you know, and, uh, but just stayed on me. There was another guy, uh, another professor that I had, uh, Dr. Ben Rogers, when I, uh, we've been doing work in Africa, uh, probably for actually about 14 years in Malawi, Africa. We'll, uh, this July, we'll go over and uh, open up our learning center, what we call the Village of Hope. In 2006, we bought two, uh, two acres of land. We have four buildings on there now. There'll be two dormitories where 24 men, 24 women will be able to stay there. They'll learn literacy, Bible, and a skill. We're teaching, teaching them sewing. Hmm. And that's for the purpose of making sure that they can be, uh, uh, you know, be viable citizens in their community. Uh, we, there, uh, one young lady, we, I call her my, my niece, Shaista Narenda. We sent her to uh, University of Malawi. She's graduated and now she's going into politics. We have her daughter, uh, I forget her, uh, uh, Betty, Betty Narenda. And we're sending her and she's gonna become a journalist. All of that as a result of uh, one of my professors, Ben Rogers. He was a, used to be a member years ago of First Baptist downtown. Well, ben Rogers, Brother Gary, you need to go to Africa. You know, Doc, I'm not going to Africa. Mm -hmm. You need to go to Africa. Doc, I'm not going to Africa. I invited him to come to our church. He preached, and before he preached, we were in the back and he prayed. And in the prayer, we were all made, had our, you know, in a circle. And he told all the ministers and deacons, listen, brothers, I want you guys to send your pastor to Africa with me <laughs> next year. And man, the door broke open. Uh -huh. And from that day to this, I've been going back ever since. So those would be, yeah. you know, the, the men who uh, probably had the greatest impact upon my life. Where, 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 where did you do your formal studies? Uh, Luther Rice Seminary. Matter mm -hmm. of fact, my... Uh, when it was here? Yes, it uh -huh. was here. Matt, and as a matter of fact, we had... For two years, the extension center was run out of our church. Okay. And so uh, Dr. Flanagan is, you know, the president. And so then did uh, my studies there and uh, also, so got that and then my uh, uh, master's mm -hmm. uh, uh, in biblical study, in apologetics Good deal. Uh, there as well, so. Good mm -hmm. deal. Um, so what would you say have been keys over the period of time for the uh, development of the church after you kind of got your feet under you mm -hmm. and kind of settled in, mm -hmm. what do you think have been keys over these years for the development of First Baptist? Uh, one of the first keys is, uh, is uh, what Paul says, uh, 2 Timothy 2.15, study to show thyself approval, workman unto God, needeth not be ashamed, rightly divided, skillfully divided, the word of truth. Uh, that has been, uh, the saving grace, I, I mean, you know, one of the things that I tell people is that the word, the word of God does it all. Mm. It, it buries, it comforts, it corrects, it raises the money, whatever you need it to do. And so my chief concern has, to, has been to uh, make sure that I'm skilled in the word of God, that as people leave, that they leave fed, they leave taught, they leave challenged, charged, and changed. It, that has been the, the, it's been the fundamental key of our church. Uh, the motto of our church is that it is the church where the word of God is changing lives. And so one of the things that I tell our, you know, we, I have less associates than, than we used to have. Some of them have gone and they, they've been a part of churches, but those who preach know that I'm very hard on them. If you get up, and it, it be, you know, because we take time with them in our absence. I said, listen, it, it takes, you know, us in, ex in excess of $200,000 every month to run First Baptist. So listen, we don't need people visiting, going other places, <laughs> what pastor, <laughs> pastor's not here. So uh -huh. listen, when you, I, I have no complex. I know I'm not the best preacher. I know I ain't the worst. Uh -huh. But I tell them is now, listen, <laughs> if, if I give you that opportunity, now listen, I don't need an Easter speech. <laughs> you better preach and teach the word of God. Sure. I want you to bring the best that you have. And in that, we want to make this the norm. That's what we want to do because 
when I'm out, I want to make sure that things are still flowing steady. I've had one of our uh, persons uh, who was over our hospitality. She is, uh, sh she's, uh, she's into another ministry now, but she said at uh, our state of the church at the first part of the year, and I didn't know this until she said it. We, we used to have one worship a year. We have it at university, at the first Sunday in the year at University of uh, North Florida. Well, she said, uh, she said, well, listen, when I first attended the church, she said, I didn't know that that wasn't the pastor who was preaching and the word was good. Mm. She said, the second Sunday that I came, it still wasn't the pastor and it was one of the other ministers and the word was good as well. And so she said, well, uh, uh, Sister Woodbine is her name, uh, Sharon and Paul Woodbine. She said that I told Paul, well, if these guys are preaching like this. The pastor got to be able to preach now. I'm, you know, and I'm not saying that I'm, you know, uh -huh, uh -huh. but it was just, it's the mindset of trying to uh, uh, establish a consistency of, of feeding people the word of God. That has been, and this is what I tell people. People ask, well, okay, well, how did you grow it? It's through the word. Amen. I mean, it, it, I, you know, it's not through the choirs. It's through... Everything else, you know, are what I consider, you know, uh, sidebars or whatever. But, man, we built it on the Word is what we've done. Man, and, and uh, with all due respect, the guy has got to be crazy if you don't want the fellas to do well when you're absent. You, you want them to, right. you, want to you want to come back and they say, whoa, well, Pastor, we had a great day. What, you don't want to be like. you should. Well, yeah, no, yes, right, I mean, right, you, right. when you come home and they, and they say, no, Pastor, where you find him? <laughs> you, you don't want that. Because <laughs> it's a reflection on you as well. It is a reflection yeah, yeah. on you as well. You're absolutely <laughs> right. So um, you're, 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 my, you're my favorite TV preacher oh, in Jacksonville, well, of course. Well, I, so, and well, I, I, well, I love your work, man. Right? <laughs> <laughs> um, and I appreciate your teaching style Praise of God. preaching. Um, that, that is not, though, uh, broad motto mm. among African-American Baptists. Mm. Uh, what, what influenced you toward a more teaching style of preaching? That's a great question, Pastor. Uh, finding myself. Hmm. Uh, you know, my, my, my I grew up, my fa you know, the, the era that I grew up in is that uh, was just hoopers. And, yeah. I, and you know, yeah, you yeah. know, <laughs> I mean, and, we, and yeah. we still have that, yeah. you know. And then, you know, I've, I've been gifted, I, you know, I can sing, I can, you know, so, intonations and all that I could you know I'm uh, you know Lord has blessed me with you know being able to do that you know the challenge came is in finding myself my dad was an orator and somewhat of a hooper you know my, 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 my pastor was kind of somewhat of that so of course you know you you grow up in that you you emulate that you know and so uh and so I would do that, and then over time, people, man, you sound just like your dad. You sound just like your dad, on and so forth. And and uh, what I discovered was I got a greater joy out of dissecting the mm. Word of God. I mean, man, just you know, I, words excite me, meanings excite me, definitions excite me, and I was, you know, and so and 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 I found out equally is that I was as inspired in teaching a lot as I was in, in, in you know, pre preaching. And so it was, a, you know, it, it took, you know, it took some time until I finally found me mm -hmm. is what it was. And when I did that, I said, hey, man, you know, now, you know, sometimes I slip into, you know, <laughs> into old school. Yeah, you yeah, know. Yeah. But I mean, but for the most part, even if you watch the broadcast, it's, you know, and, and you know, I'm still excited, you know, sure. about the word of God. But it was just, it was finding myself. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. And we confuse passion in, when we define it in terms of volume right. and, th and right. things like that. Right, yeah. right, right. And I think we do a disservice, you know, and I'll say this, you know, years ago, and we still hear that not as much as what we used to hear on, on a lot of times on radio, is that whenever a preacher was coming to town, and this is one of the things that always bothered me, and, and this is in black radio, is mm -hmm. that they would play the hoop, you know. Right. Well, if that's the drawing card, mm -hmm. then what it means is that uh, a lot of times the substance of what is said is lost, you know, until the very end. And you mean to tell me that you've missed all of, you know, what has transpired. So, you know, and, it, you know, so it was, it was really just finding me. 
you know, just not so much radio now as much as YouTube clips now. So ah, <laughs> you're absolutely <right. laughs> one of the things I remember, um, I couldn't steal the pastor's uh, flyer uh, when I first saw your name advertising your pastor's conference. Right. But uh, I did note the uh, church website right. and went on to uh, learn more about the church and kind of started following your ministry mm. then. You also had a very clear statement of faith and very defined convictions about where your church stands. Right. Um, on, of course, the es essentials of the historic Christian faith. Right. But on a lot of other issues that uh, are swirling about, right. that are to some people right. controversial. Right. And we live in a day where there was more of an integrity of name, right. maybe when we were coming up. Right. You knew what a Baptist was right, and right. you knew what a Kojic was. Right. And you knew they weren't the same thing. <laughs> <laughs> right? That's correct. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> and um, that's no longer the case. Mm. And maybe younger men or newer pastors, mm. not always out of uh, conviction, but out of a sense of pressure that you have to do certain things right. to s either survive or be successful right. or shaping their ministry. Right. Um, what just kind of got you to a place where you, I'm throwing down the gauntlet, this is where we are, y'all deal with it. And uh, uh, man, that's a, that's a, I've been asked that question on, on several different, from different pastors, man, mm -hmm. you know, what you got on your website. And part of that was, is, is it still up there? It is still there. Good deal. It, well, when you, you know, the, the website has changed, but when you go in to look at what we believe, it's still there. Good deal. And part of that is as a result of the fact, it's, it's finding yourself, mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, and pastors, the thing that challenged me most was the fact of knowing what was right from scripture. Mm. You know, um, as I said, my, 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 bachelor is in biblical studies my master is in apologetics and that that's being able to defend the faith and you can't defend the faith if you don't understand what the faith is sure and so in that and it's is um the greatest challenge of young seminarians is this and I, I i had the opportunity to sit on the presbytery of a friend of mine uh who was uh being his son was being ordained he was engaged to marry uh, the president, the daughter of the president of the Southern Baptist Convention, Hayes Wicker at that particular time. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, Eric Yeldell was his name. I told Eric this, I said, one of your greatest challenges is gonna be this, is that as you graduate from seminary, you're gonna know what the scripture says, you're gonna know what the gospel says. But as you go on, you, you know, as you graduate, you may get a church, your friend may get a church, your friend is gonna do some things that you know that's not biblical, but it's gonna work. Wow. And your challenge is going to be, okay, in order to grow my church, do I do what he is doing or do I stick with the faith? And it, it is, uh, it's, a, it's the Waterloo. It's a defining moment in ministry. Uh, when I first, you know, you know, I, I, you were kind. You didn't say the things that were. <laughs> <laughs> well, you and I are on the same page. I, I'm I, just, know, I didn't want to wade you I, out yeah, there because no, look me out what you're you comfortable. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, man. Uh-huh. But, uh, you know, we talk about, you know, now we believe, you know, tongues are a gift of the spirit. Mm -hmm. But now, according to First Corinthians, you know, it, it's not to be done, you know, in the setting of, of, of the local assembly. If it's done in the setting of the assembly, then there needs to be an interpreter. Mm -hmm. All right. We talk about uh, common law marriage, mm -hmm. you know, shacking up. We, you know, mm -hmm. we talk against homosexuality. Mm -hmm. You know, the buzzword of today is tolerance, you know. And what's interesting is... The word tolerance actually means the definition of it. You look the definition of it up. It means to really accommodate something that you disagree with, which is really crazy. Yeah. And what's interesting upon society and college campuses is that they want us to tolerate what they want, but they don't tolerate what we believe. Sure. <laughs> so, I mean, the very thing that they say, well, couple beloved, they're a couple beloved. And so we talk about homosexuality, lesbianism, you know, women pastors. We talk about that, you know, according, you know, according to the faith now. That people say, well, you know, that's a cultural thing, get with the times, on and so forth. We believe that men are the priests of the family. That's not chauvinistic. God created Adam first, and then in that, uh, he made him the priest of the family. Those are just, you know, uh, biblical tenets of the faith. Yeah. Uh, and in that, the same 
he's to be not only priest in the home, but he's also to be priest at the church. Right. And so he, he which is, is a contradiction. It if, is a, if, it, if, it, if you have it any other way. That's exactly right. Because right. in that, you know, and, and this, this, you know, anytime you come across a, a, a scripture that you think is difficult, you interpret it with a clearer passage of scripture. Sure. And so the word of God complements itself. You know, so it was those things that we, you know, we talk about tithe and offering. And it was really kind of seven things that we put out there. Initially, you know, and we subscribe to, and we don't read and really sing from our hymnals anymore, but in the back of the hymnal, there are 18 articles of faith. Yes. You know, we talk about civil government, you know, all of those things. And we subscribe to those, and a lot of times we talked about those, but what I discovered was this is that people were coming, becoming a part of our church. And we were going through the, you know, the, uh, the 18 articles of faith, which was, I mean, and it's, you know, it's somewhat arduous. You know, we, we simplified it as much as we could. The Spirit of God led me to deal with what are the most prevalent things that we believe as a church that would, that would get people to a place and to the point that when they looked on the website or say, what do you believe? Mm -hmm. That at the door, they would determine, I want to be a part of this church or this ain't for me. Wow. And First Baptist of Mandarin, we, we call ourselves Hope, First Church Hopewell now because we're in the process of building as well. It ain't for everybody, you know? And so it, it was not my mindset. People told me this, well, your church is not gonna grow if you don't have women pastors. And listen, I'm, all I'm doing is trying to do, lead the people that God has given me to lead, be the pastor that according to the word of God from what I understand it and according to what it says. Yeah. That's all I'm trying to do. Now, we have so many different variations of what people believe now on and so forth. So, you know, but I just, man, I just resolve, you know, I know one day, Pastor, I got to stand before the judgment seat. Of Christ. I got to give an account for what I do as a pastor. Yep. And so, man, I want my, I, I want the Lord to say, well done. Amen. So that's it. Yeah. 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 I respect you, man, for that. Yeah. And I, I think um, one of the things I think about where there is the pressure to not do what you are saying right. by so many circles. The fact of the matter is, and I feel this way, you know, as a conscious Baptist, I'm just, I'm, I'm at where all y'all, you know, were. The, the church, they, these are not novel beliefs. Right, right, right. <laughs> Other folk have moved. Right. This is, this is where the church has been. Right. Yes? Right. And, um, I don't think I should have to apologize for not moving. Right. I, I uh, taught last night our Sunday school teachers, mm -hmm. and uh, I was uh, I did a lecture on teaching with spiritual authority. Mm -hmm. um, I kind of started with uh, the conclusion of the Sermon on the Mount. Mm -hmm. where the people were astonished at his teaching mm -hmm. because he taught them as one having authority, not as uh, the scribes. Mm -hmm. But I, I really think, and I said this, I, I poured out my heart to the teachers with so many of the issues we're talking about, mm. what, we, what, what is the main issue is that we are at a crisis of authority. Mm. What is the basis of your authority? Mm. And if the word of God is your authority, mm. then you have an obligation, mm. yes, mm. to be committed to the truth, mm. but it also makes the world a whole lot easier. That's right, that's right. <laughs> yeah, it does, that's right. Because you don't have to, you, you know, how do you defend a lion? Let him out the cage, he'll defend himself. Sure. The word of God is the same way. Absolutely. And so, you know, and I, and I commend you as well because in, you know, we live in a day now of mega change. Mm -hmm. uh, Andrew Malfors has a book entitled St uh, Strategic Planning Advancement, deals with the church. Mm -hmm. And, he, you know, there was a time when he mentioned that uh, change would take place, you know, 10 years, 15 years. Well, you think about it. You know, we have these iPhones and Galaxies and Androids, and no sooner than we get them out the box, three months later, okay, you got people standing in line, guess what, to get another. Sure. Because, and, and that's the appetite that we, we have. It's, it's insatiable. It's to the place and to the point that we want things quick, fast, and in a hurry. And so in that, a lot of times what happens is that truth gets lost in the shuffle. Wow. Because what begins to happen is that as long as 
people see things occurring. And, and, you know, we're both on TV, but I say there's a lot of TV preaching that's messed a lot of folks up. I mean, it, you know, I ain't saying we did it. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, I, I, you know, I, I, get to, I get to railing against TV preachers, and my wife says, you do know you wanted that. <laughs> and I'm like, no, no. <laughs> yes, you know, but, but you're we, right. You know, people see things void of being able to substantiate it. And in that, just like there are trends, just like there are trends in culture, just like there are trends in society, there are trends in church and Christian. You know, I'm just, years ago, we even see it now. Well, a lot of times, you know, and this, this has happened to me, and I'm, I'm just, I'm keeping it personal. Sure. You know, I was preaching, man, and, and man, you know, I was at a church, I was invited to you know, preach at the church, and man, so people start bringing money up and throwing at the pulpit, you know, so man, and it's, <laughs> It jacked with me, and the reason it jacked with me because now, I, you know, I was looking down, and I didn't know whether it was a five or a fifty. And then, you know, my flesh was saying, "Okay, well, man, bear down on that point." Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and so, man, you wow. know, at, at the end of the service, you know, the guy he collected all of the money, gave it to me. Man, and my spirit was so grieved, Pastor. Yeah. My spirit was so grieved. I called him up. And I said, listen, man, I said, in no way has God made me the measuring rod for ministry. I said, but during the time of my proclamation, the proclamation of the word of God, that's my time to give, not to receive. Wow. You know, give me an honorarium, Woo. do whatever. And, and, and understand that that really comes, if we really would be honest, it comes from the mindset of a subculture. Yeah, yeah. Now, you know, we're born again and we're saved, but you know, in a lot of these bars, you go in, and when them girls go to dancing, well, guess what? If depending on how they're moving the guys, guess what you do? You start paying out. That's a subculture mentality. Mm -hmm. We bring things into the house of God wow. that have no biblical reference. Paul says in First Corinthians 16, "Get the collection so the first day of the week when I come by." I, you know, There'll be no, yeah, yeah. you know, yes, and sir. so, man, you know, and so <laughs> wow. we, we see things and because we see it working just because it's working does not mean it has a biblical base. Right. And it, so and that's that's our challenge of the day. And, um, you know, we both of us would agree that um, we should use whatever mediums we can. Absolutely. To get the We're not criticizing that. That's right. But the, the danger is, you're absolutely right, the whole throwing money on the platform right. is not the result of diligent search of scripture. That's because you saw that on TV. That's right. And, and so many of the trends, right. you know, um, I, I would just say even on a much broader cultural issue, mm. the changing mores about something like homosexuality and gay marriage right. is being driven by media influence. It is. You know, it um, is. And them determining what is acceptable and not acceptable right. more than Christians really, really and, bearing and, down on what their convictions are. And what are. helps, what, what loosens, Charles Jackson, the guy that I was telling you about, Pastor, I was telling you about in uh, Houston, and he said this, and I, it's a saying that is, will forever remain seared in my conscience. He says that cold preaching, cold preaching makes a bold sinner. <laughs> you know, when, I, when our preaching is, is watered, you know, when is it, is it a place where it is void of life, when it becomes so accommodated, cold preaching makes for bold sinners. The other thing is this, is that what the enemy aims to do is to legitimize. Anytime he can legitimize something, he uses, he attacks the entities of our society, be it the government, be it the church. It's already been in society, but when, when, when the government passes laws, and, and what history has proven is this, is that anytime laws become passed, regardless of how difficult they have been or how controversial they've been, at some particular point in society, society begins to lax. Why? Because it has become law, and law subconsciously and subliminally means approval in a certain way. Wow. And so it's imperative that, uh, uh, that we make sure that we toe the line. Uh, uh, Vody Bauckham was, was, was he, uh, 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 Tony Evans in Dallas, they were both speaking at different times on this issue. And, and, you know, and, and, and I thank God for their stand. One of the things that they said, well, we take our cue from the word of God, not according to society. Sure. So, I mean, and that's the, ch the challenge of today's church 
is to have a consistent message of scripture. Yeah. And we're, we've, I'm not gonna say that's lost altogether, but we're losing, we're losing ground on that. I totally agree. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm not gonna forget that yeah. though. Cold preaching, preaching makes, makes for bold sense. Bold sense. My, my. Yes, sir. Um, just a couple more questions. Okay. Because um, <clears throat> you can be where you are and what you're discussing by good intentions, but your commitment to the word in very practical ways um, has to back that up. Mm. So you are a busy pastor, mm. Um, mm. very strong, mm. growing church, mm. media ministry, mm. school, um, several thousands that you're pastoring. You all are building all of those things. Maybe one way to go at it is, what, what is a typical week? I know for many pastors, there's no such thing. <laughs> what is a typical work week for you? <sighs> and how do you maintain, because if you're not careful, you can spend the whole week dealing with all of those things while that text sits in the corner right. until Saturday night. Right. <laughs> right. And then it starts screaming at you. Right. Yes? Right. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, and you know this, our, our weeks are atypical. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the, and the, one of the biggest challenges is dealing with those things that you didn't expect. You know, a lot of times you don't have the greatest intentions. Uh, you know, okay, we're going to do this, 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 and this. But, I mean, it's, it's just, you know, I tell, I said this to uh, our fellowship the other day. One thing I don't do is back up getting my check. <laughs> I say, well, uh -huh. you know, and I tell people, you're welcome to, you know, follow me just within a day. You uh -huh. know, uh, I don't counsel as much, but, uh, you know, I, I have to spend m much more now, uh, much more time in study because I, I preach actually five times a week. I do uh, three times on Sunday, uh, uh, twice at our Mandarin campus and then at the satellite campus that we started in St. John's County. So I'll do seven, I'll do uh, nine at the satellite, then I'll come back and do 11. On Wednesday nights, I'll do Wednesday nights at the main campus and then Thursday nights at uh, the St. John's campus. A typical day would be me perhaps getting up around uh, 6.30 one of the things that I try to do at least three to four times is a week is go to the gym. You know, either do some lifting, do some, you know, to try to get stress off on and so forth. Hmm. Typically, uh, you know, that after that I eat breakfast, I'm in the office typically about nine or 9.30. Uh, what I'm typically doing then is that I'm either working on our plans for the next six months, next, uh, uh, the, the next year, uh, meeting with people, uh, counseling. Uh, we're in a, a building phase now, so you know a lot of times I'm meeting with my executive pastor because we're going over the numbers. I mean, this you know is that coupled with study, that coupled with you know counseling, that cou coupled with meetings in the community. Uh, you know, and, and so I mean, it, every day is a is a, you know is it's a, it's it's weird. So please know? tell me your teaching the same thing on Wednesday or Thursday night? Actually, I am. And a pastor told me this several, actually. Uh, and on Sunday mornings, you do yes, the same? Sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And I start, I've, I've been doing that probably about six years. I started doing that in my 17th year of ministry. And uh, a pastor, local pastor asked, well, where are you preaching? This was the time that we were just, you know, just at our main campus. And uh, you're doing two different sermons? I said, yeah, why? I said, well, you know, whatever my reasons were. And uh, he said, man, don't do that. You know, do the same one. He said, you know, by the time you get to the, le you know, you, Lord would have added a lot more to it about that. <laughs> yeah, right. And so I've, you know, I've been doing that since then. Mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, uh, we, we write a lot of our material. I, I write a lot of our material. A lot of things that I look for for our church. Uh, you know, I can't find, you know, in the bookstore that, you know, that, that uh, that is actually the way that I want it. We did something last year, I came up and that took first part of the year of just getting it done. But in September of last year, from September to November, we went through something where I call 3D plus one. We've actually copyrighted it. And uh, that's commitment to Christ, church, community and change. And so that it was a curriculum designed to help every one of our members assess where they are in their faith. 
what is your commitment to Christ? We had them to do a pre-eval and a post-eval. And the pre-eval, we had them before they even went through the, the, the series, all right, you know, we asked about 15 questions. We took those same questions and asked them at the end mm. to see where they were. And whatever that they found that was different or where they found where their weaknesses were, what we asked them to do is to write in a sentence or two what they would do to change it. And then over the next seven days, commit it to prayer. And so we did that commitment to Christ Church Community and Change. We call it 3D plus one. Uh, right now, we're going through something that we, as I said, a lot of our material we write, and that's what a lot of my time, you know, is it, it, consumed with, is what we call Countdown to Calvary. What we did with there was to take, starting on March the 12th, leading up to Easter, is to take a nugget. We took the devotional, made a devotional, and took a nugget out of the life of our Lord for each day for 40 days that we've made that into a devotional. Mm. And then so each Wednesday and Thursday and Sunday, I preach and we go over the things that our Lord has been through and then we focus on how does, you know, how, how are we able to live the cross and to live out Calvary. So a lot, of the, a lot of the things that we do at our church, it is centered around us coming up with our own curriculum, yeah. you know, and going forth from there. You typically teach and preach in series. I, 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 I do, I, you know, sometimes I'm all over the place, but yes, I, I, for the most part I do. Gotcha. Yeah. Um, so on what days do you have certain days where you're saying I have to get heavy lifting done on certain days or you're, or you're, you're just kind of, it just is shaped by how the week goes in terms well, of study. And well, study, uh, <coughs> Tuesdays and Thursdays are, are designated for study. Mm -hmm. Tuesdays and Thursdays. There's no, you know, uh, you know, if, if I see people, I'll try to do them on Mondays or whatever. Uh, but, you know, Tuesdays and Thursdays are kind of those designated days. And I'm wired differently. I'm just, you know, my daughter is like this. My youngest daughter is like this. Uh, she has a, her degree in uh, uh, elementary education. She said, Dad, she said, looks like as I get closer toward my deadline, that that's when, you know, everything. And I said, baby, I'm the same. You got it. <laughs> you know, we got the same genes. Uh -huh. And so, uh, for me, Friday, Friday is the day, Friday and Saturday mornings are the day for Sunday. Sure. Now, you know, the, where I'm going has to be in place, or at least, you know, the, the topic, mm -hmm. the passage, that has to be in place now before Friday. Mm -hmm. But what I've discovered is, especially leading up to Sunday, if I start too early, I can't get any traction. It's just, you know, yeah. and man, now, actually, Fridays are my better days for study. I do absolutely nothing. I wake up in the morning. Sometimes I, I will go to the gym. Sometimes I won't. But I'll go in my study at the house or I go up to the church because Fridays are th the staff day off on, uh, at the church so I can get a lot of work done. And so Fridays, I'm, I mean, for the most part of it, 75% of that message on Friday is done. I usually rest on it Friday, Saturday I get up and I'm fresh and I can, you know, just, you know, my points and all are already there, but I look for more content is what I do. Are you, what are you taking to the pulpit on Sundays? My Bible. Your Bible. Yeah. Are, are you writing out a full manuscript? Or are do. you writing out an extensive outline? Well, what? no, I, what I do is that uh, I, I write out my full manuscript, mm -hmm. what I'll typically do once I have the passage, I focus then on the major points to uh, extract from the text. Once I get the major points, the major points some, a lot of times is the most difficult part, but once I get those, then it's a, 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 a fact of adding the content. Once the content is there, this, well, this is what I'll do. You know, I'll, I'll get my points, and then what I'll do is that I'll fill in the points with the content. I'll, you know, get my scripture references. I'll get my illustrations. I'll, you know, hone in on the things that I need to make at each one of those points. Uh, and I'll build that all Friday, Saturday morning. I'll get up and I'll build it again. Typically what I do is that it's all typed out. Uh, uh, Saturday, it's all typed out. I'll, what I do now is that I'll put it in the PowerPoint because sometimes there are illustrations and things that I want to bring in the PowerPoint. Sunday morning, what I do, I get up at five o'clock. I'll get up five o'clock. You know, our early morning service starts at seven. I'll get up at five 
take a shower. I'm usually at the breakfast table at uh, 5.30. I have oatmeal, a cup of coffee, turkey, bacon, <laughs> and uh, I'll eat uh, uh, boiled eggs, but just uh, the white, not the yolk. So that's, that's, I mean, that's, that's clockwork. That's every Sunday morning, 5.30, I'm at the table. And what I literally do with a printed manuscript is that I just kind of write down, you know, the notes and thoughts on and, fo and so forth from there, you know, on the side in the, in the, uh, kind of in the margin. And from there, I leave the manuscript there and just go, you know, just take my Bible and we go to work from there. So it's what we do. That is way cool, man. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but I think I, I think I am like that as well. Yeah. I, I, I try to have a schedule during the week. Yeah. But Friday and yeah, Saturday, yeah. because it's coming. Right. And um, you, I don't want to take anything to the pulpit. Right. The closer to Sunday, right. I can spend time right, right. thinking about it. And, and what, <clears throat> you know, from, from, from the time that I've started working on, once I get the the message, the title of the message and the points, you know, for the most part that is, you know, and as you're, as you're going through, what makes it easier to remember as well uh, is the mere fact that, you know, you've, as you're putting it, as you're putting it together, then a lot of it, you, ha you know, it's already resonating with you. Um, Adrian Rogers says, said this, a matter of fact, uh, one of his last, uh, uh, events he did was at First Baptist of Naples, and yeah. I, I went to that. Uh, it, it was a uh, just a simple uh, gathering called "It's It's Monday, but Sunday's coming." Mm. And I asked him the question. I said, "Well, you know, Dr. Rogers." I said, "Well, how many times do you preach your sermons?" He said, "Well, brother, the first thing I do," he said, "I preach it to Jesus. That's the first thing that I do. So I preach it then, and then he says, then I preach it to myself, and then I preach it to the congregation." And one of the things that I, I tell ministers is that there are three times you do a message, you do it before you do it, when you do it, and then after you do it, you know, because you go back and kind of say, well, I left this out or I left that out on so. So one more question. Okay. Well, about the books, where, if, where could the, uh, you can, find the book? As a matter of fact, where I'm, just about all of them are in revision now. I'm, I'm revised, you know, as, and you'll discover as a writer, <laughs> as a writer uh -huh. you know, when you first come out with things, you're excited on and so forth as you begin to grow. Uh -huh. You're like, man, I need to do, you yeah, know. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, and what I did was, because one of the things that I'm in the process of doing is getting a literary agent. Okay. And, and we're redoing our website, we're, you know, and, and also building the new church. And you can call our church and, and, and get the books, but you know, I'm doing all of the covers over, you know, just, sure. you know, so sure. that was, you know, some of those written six or seven years ago. So that's what I'm doing now. All of them are in revision. Good deal. Yeah, yeah. Good deal. Well, one more question. Mm -hmm. You, um, this is my question I like to ask. Okay. You have discovered a time machine mm -hmm. and you are able to, able to go back 24 years mm -hmm. to talk to young Gary Williams, mm -hmm. who is first beginning his pastorate mm. at uh, First Baptist Mandarin, mm. knowing what you know now, what advice would you give Gary Williams mm. that you would run into 20 years ago? Um, that's a, wow. It's, I, I, can, I really can't think of anything that I, uh, that I would go back mm -hmm. and tell myself mm -hmm. uh, because at, at some of the mistakes that I made, I knew. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so it, you know, and so it's not a point of me, you know, either, and that, and 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 I don't want that to come across the wrong way. Like I knew everything. It's not that. Sure you know, and, but there were things that, you know, I became some, that I really wasn't naive. I really wasn't naive. There was just things that I just, I, I became couple, I just did or I didn't do, but it was not because of naivety. It wasn't as a result of that. And uh, I mean, you know, some of the things that I did, it, you know, that, 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 you know, good, bad, or indifferent, you know, that I look back on, I knew better. Hmm. And so I, you know, for whatever reason, you know, I just, you know, but uh, I mean, and then the other thing is this, uh, 
you know, I'm a firm believer in, you know, past experiences formulate present personalities. We are what we are as a result of what we've been through. Mm. Uh, and so I would, you know, the, the, the things that I have done, the mistakes that have been made, you know, I think they were, I took them as, as a learning experience and, you know, and, uh, and I've tried to learn from them, you know, so, you know so, so I don't know if I have from all, but I've tried to learn from them. But I think, you know, I think that the things that I've done and some of the mistakes, you know, just thinking on the surface, the, you know, the things that I've done, you know, there's, there are some things I would have, I should have done differently, no doubt about that. But I think as far as doing differently, you know, saying, hey, don't do this and, and do that. The people who, that I had in my life at the time that I started and even before I started pastoring, had given me sufficient enough information to do what I needed to do. Mm. And I think it was just at that point where whether or not I either listened, I heeded at that time, I chose to, you know, to do whatever I was doing. And so uh, there wasn't a lot of things that I wasn't in the dark on. It was just, you know, probably me being hard headed or stubborn or Gary just being Gary is yeah. Yeah, more so what it was. And uh, the dynamic of that is, man, there's, a, you know, the doctrinal principle there just a providence yeah you know yeah. you're right the all things yeah. meaning good and bad yeah. are working together yeah to conform us to the yeah. image of, of the Lord Jesus Christ yeah and um, if it were not for some yeah. of the mistakes I made some yeah. of the very you may be tempted to go back and erase some of the very low points but if it were not for those I wouldn't be where I am this those are character that's right shaping that's right ministry that's directing right. events in life that's right and all of those and that and you know, it took me a minute to kind of think about it, but, it, you know, as I start thinking about it, and that's it, I mean, you, I think you really expressed it very well. Mm -hmm. You know, it has helped, to, it, you know, it has helped me to be able to pour into others. It has helped me to be able to share with others, on and so forth. It has helped me to learn and grow. And the irony of that is this, is that those people who shared the things that they shared with me, it was as a result of the providence of God in their own lives as well, Absolutely. you know, in the shaping of them. And so they were able to share and, you know, and, to, and so that's, you know, you know, as I said, it, it is, you know, I would hate to be in the position that I am, void of the things that I have been through, because I wouldn't know how to handle the impending things that would occur in my life today. Mm. You know, I oftentimes people, and, and I've heard people say, man, you know, God has given me everything that I've asked for. Well, God ain't gave me, every, <laughs> given me everything I've asked for. Right. And by his grace, he hadn't done that. You know, there are times in life and, you know, every mountain that you speak to is not going to move. Mm -hmm. So you got to learn how to persevere. You know, John 16, 33, in this life, you're going to have some tribulations. Be of good cheer. I've overcome the world. Yes. You know, many are the affliction of the righteous. God delivered them out of them all, you know. And so we have a one dimensional side of faith, a one dimensional side of Christ. Of, you know, Job went through what he went through by God's providence because Job only knew God in one dimension. He knew him in the feast, but didn't know him in the family. <laughs> and so once he was able to understand that God is still God, regardless of what I go through. Yeah. And see, when you relegate him to only to the good times, when his times are not good, you stop worshiping. Absolutely. You stop praising. So it helps to, you know, uh, it helps to develop. So, you know, you know, the old folk put it this way. I wouldn't take nothing from the journey. <laughs> so, you know, I leave it at that. Amen. You know? Amen. You've been very generous with your time, man. man and I appreciate it. And I, I, I'm just encouraged by mm. the testimony of your ministry. Yeah to being able to point to you as an example in our city Praise and God. the uh, great work of your church, man. Well, man, I, I, let me, uh, you know, as we close out, man, I want to thank you for this opportunity. Mm -hmm. uh, I want to thank you for the hard work that you do. Mm -hmm. I want to thank you for the diligence of scripture that you exhibit to uh, the city on a weekly basis, man of God. Mm -hmm. Continue to do that. I think you are a great voice. You know, a lot of times, uh, you know, the, the, the larger you are, the more you become a target, you know, mm -hmm. uh, and, that, and that's always, you know, when the person who's out there the most. And so, but man, I, I think you exhibit 
what we need uh, in the Christian faith. Mm -hmm. Continue to do what you're doing, man. Continue yeah. to stand tall, cry loud, spare not. Yeah. Uh, take care of yourself. Take care of your family. You yeah. know, get you some rest, but do the things that you need to do, man. And I, I just pray that God, I appreciate the invitation of coming. I pray that God continues to bless you, man, bless your family, and bless this ministry. Thank you so much, yeah, brother. Man. All yeah. the best. And yeah. thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for watching. I hope you're blessed by what you see. Second Timothy 2.15 says, Present yourself to God as one approved, a workman who does not need to be ashamed, rightly handling the word of truth. The phrase rightly handling simply means to cut it straight. Paul used it as a tent maker. Construction workers used it in paving a smooth path or road. Doctors used it in reference to making a clean incision for surgery. And scripture uses it to say that you ought to rightly handle the word of God in the preaching moment. I'm inviting you to join us for the Cutting It Straight Expository Preaching Conference here in Jacksonville, September 24 through 26, 2014. We will give you practical instruction in Bible exposition. We will model faithful preaching for you. And we'll encourage you in your journey to preach faithfully the word of God. I hope you'll join us for this special time.